Greetings and welcome to a familiar yet unfamiliar episode of Genre Grinder. I'm your host Gabe and with me today returning I believe four years after her last appearance is Anne-Marie Taylor. Say hello. Hi. It's been it's such a pleasure to be back here Gabe. Has it been four years? Wow. I know isn't that crazy? It's like I know it's been a while but when I actually looked and I'm like wow that was the last time we talked the world was being ravaged by a pandemic. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Donald Trump and Joe Biden were running against each other for president. Well, that part's the same. Yeah, uh, again. Uh, Joe Biden announced that he was dropping out of the race literally as we were recording this. It might have been this exact moment for all I know. So uh, disregard that. A cicada brood was threatening to flood America with bugs. And that part's the same, too. Oh my gosh, really? And it did sound like uh, bird flu was was like a contender for another. <laughs> there was a little bit there where it sounded like we were going to have a bird flu pandemic because uh, I guess people were purposely drinking the raw milk from infected cows is what I read on the news. I, I don't know what was going on there. But, uh, people are interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anne Marie is, is, is someone who, like I said, we haven't talked in, in four years. And so she's someone that's not a, uh, one of my repeat uh, guests here. Um, but the last time we talked, we did a Bad Shark podcast, which for yes. me was just sort of fun. It was like less like a genre in itself. But then I realized that there is kind of like there's more Bad Shark movies than there are, you know, revisionist Westerns, probably. <laughs> there are so many. And every year there's at least one that comes out, especially in the summer. Yeah. But so uh, that we talked and then and then we we didn't necessarily lose touch, but you were busy. You went back to school, I believe is what you said. Yes. So I was working full time and I went back to school in 2022 to get a master in legal studies. And I am almost done. I have one more class to take and December of this year I will have a master in legal studies as well. So I'm going to pivot from the library field to the law field. So I'm currently looking for jobs and uh, just waiting for this class to start so I can get that piece of paper and and be like, yay, I have a degree. <laughs> so that, you know, in the interim, we, we hadn't been talking as much and I put a bunch of episodes up on YouTube just because I was told that was something you do. And for the most part, uh, the YouTube views are, you know, this is a podcast, so most people who listen to it listen to it through Apple or, you know, I guess Stitcher doesn't exist anymore, but uh, Spotify, whatever. Sure, yeah. And But you can see how many views you have very easily on YouTube. And so usually it's anywhere from like zero to like maybe uh, the one I did about sapphic vampire movies has about 650, and that's probably because people thought that there'd be video to go along with it. <laughs> sexy vampires. Um, and same with the one that we had titled the monster fuckers episode uh, that has, again, I'm pretty sure that's because of the title, and stuff. <laughs> but for some reason, Racy the, titles. yeah, exactly. The, the, the bad shark one has, uh, as I checked earlier today, 71,000 views. What? <laughs> and I, I don't know why. And it's you know, almost the, there's a couple of them have comments, but there's actually comments and everything. It's like, it's something that could become monetized if I had more subscribers. <laughs> It is wow. Not, I have no I, I guess I guess uh, YouTube viewers like the idea of bad sharks. I, I it makes sort of makes sense. I, I put some keywords in like uh, the movies we had covered. So maybe that was part of it. But um, it was very, very funny. And so being the rabid capitalist, I am. I, <laughs> people are begging for a sequel here. Oh, absolutely. And we just, you know, we're recording this uh, at a time when we're just past Shark Week. So. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And then there's like a, um, I noticed that the National Geographic does a sort of yes. like shark week at the same time. <laughs> yeah, they have their own because everybody was like, wait, wait, we can get eyeballs and yeah. people are like really into sharks. And I will admit, like, I am a person whose mantra is like, live every week like it's shark week. But I have not actually watched any this year because it has started to get to my mind, a tad bit ridiculous. Sorry, yeah. Discovery. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it is interesting having only, I don't have cable or anymore. I just have streaming services, but both HBO Max and Disney Plus are just covered in shark stuff b- between right. Discovery and Net Geo. It's kind of, yeah. Yeah. 
And then, um, well, and so, so what we're actually doing, we were ta- we talked about doing another Bad Shark episode because, like we said, there's seven thousand million, so many movies. <laughs> um, but instead, I had this idea years ago that uh, there are certain movies that are remade over and over and over again. Sometimes to rip off an, the original. Yes. But sometimes I think it's almost subconscious. One of them is is for me uh, at a certain like like when I was in my teens, I noticed how many sequels use the structure of Empire Strikes Back as mm. a very specific structure. And so, being a nerd, I made like a uh, when I learned how to use um, not QuickBooks uh, Excel, I made an Excel spreadsheet of <laughs> the major plot points in Empire Strikes Back, and then how many movie sequels usually sci-fi but not always follow that idea and obviously one of these movies is jaws of course and so there are movies that are directly ripping off jaws and there Mm -hmm. are movies that are sort of just using jaws as it's you know because jaws is a good story it's just a well done story as very specific character types that you can sort of mad lib other stuff into Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Whether you need to or not. Again, I think some of these people do this by accident. None, none of the movies we're covering today are by accident, but I do think it happens by accident sometimes. And just yeah. like other examples I came up with uh, is Psycho. There's a whole bunch of movies that are just Psycho. The Yojimbo and the Rio Bravo is one where any movie where some people end up stuck in a... Like even, even the show Firefly had a Rio Bravo episode where everybody ended up stuck in a building and having to defend it from people. Yeah, coming. yeah. It's very, very similar. And then, yeah, Empire Strikes Back and Aliens is another one where if you do a sequel to a monster movie, you have to do another sequel where now the army's involved and there's more of the monsters. Always. The military always has to get involved. If the government's right. not involved, is it even a movie? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I, my favorite thing is Jaws ripoffs that don't have a shark because it's it becomes a little sometimes it's really obvious. I just I just watched for a review. I watched the movie Crocodile. Uh, from the, the late 70s and that one was just the whole last half of that movie was just uh thai guys being put in place of the american actor well american and scottish actors and a crocodile in the place of a shark but it was otherwise identical oh wow um, and and this can get pretty uh abstract my favorite which we already covered on genre grinder is dante's peak <laughs> which is a disaster movie that's structured around jaws and what happens in jaws um, interesting i have not i have to say i haven't seen that one but i might have to go back and see it now it's yeah it has the whole thing where um the main character is is in a government job of some kind either law enforcement or he's not law enforcement he enters town as an outsider of the community mm-hmm. there's something killing people in that case a of course. volcano um but there's never any witnesses so there's like a bit a little bit of a mystery Uh, And the authorities try to cover it up or downplay it because uh, it hurts their bottom line. This is always the cover up. Always. I'm reading just a list of things I came. So sometimes (laughs) it's a capitalist critique. Sometimes it's a political thing. More than Mm -hmm. that, there's usually some sort of big public event that the and, and and somebody gets hurt and the authorities can no longer downplay it. Oh yeah, always of course. And uh, the, a lot of these, I mean, this one thing that doesn't have in Dante's Peak is they put out a bounty on the problem, usually being a shark. Yes. That's one of my favorite ones. That's something that will come at the last of the four movies we're covering today has that happen. And that was, that was my light bulb moment for that. Um, and there's also a thing where the wrong shark or whatever is captured. And mm. we could refer to it as a red herring, but I, I, I like in this case, if we could, we should call it the tiger shark because, you know. <laughs> I agree. I agree. That's awesome. I love it. The best line reading in all of Jaws. Tiger shark. Oh, what? (laughs) (laughs) And then the real shark comes again and a small team has to go out and take care of business. Um, Mm -hmm. There's some sort of cat and mouse thing, hunters and the shark. Uh, The better ones will copy the part in Jaws where the men have a little sit down and talk about their scars. So, you know. The better ones will have a bonding moment. Usually, the humanity, yes. yeah. The not so good ones will totally skip over that part because it's hard to write and act those kinds of things. <laughs> it's true. It's true. You, you have to show humanity of a character that you're like, when are you getting chomped? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, and then usually they end with uh, the good guys winning and the monster being killed. 
though I have to say, I always root for the monster. Yeah, I know I mean, I'm disappointed every time, but I always root for the monster. There, there are, it takes a lot. Like, it's hard to root for the volcano, I suppose. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's, well, okay. Well, and then so, so what we're going to do, our first one here. So four, again, four movies we're going to cover. We're actually starting with a movie that you want not only want to root for the monster the monster's the protagonist in a lot of ways but also it's a movie that was made to cash in on jaws but has surprisingly little in common with it so that's the <laughs> other thing that happens is you have movies where they would just go oh jaws is popular let's just throw out another um, yes and so uh, we're going to start with orca aka orca the killer whale from 1977 I'm going to read uh, the descriptions of these just quickly from the Letterboxd website, as I tend to do. So here is the plot. After witnessing the killing of his mate and offspring at the hands of a reckless Irish captain. I don't know why they have to say he's Irish. Uh, <laughs> exotic. Um, you have to make him exotic. I guess. Uh, a vengeful killer whale rampages through the fisherman's Newfoundland harbor. Under pressure from villagers, the captain... His uh, marine biologist and indigenous tribalist uh, venture out to uh, vanquish the beast, which is a pretty good description of what happens in this movie. So, this yeah, is, this is directed by Michael Anderson. Um, but most people, I think movie people think of this as a Dino De Laurentiis movie okay? Uh, because Dino De Laurentiis, uh, the Italian producer who is trying very hard to stop being just an Italian producer, he's trying very hard to break into the American mainstream. He had... Uh, the year before this produced a not very good King Kong remake, oh. which was a minor success, but he claimed in interviews that it would outgrow Jaws, which it, it did not. Ooh, that's <laughs> and, a bad look. <laughs> yeah. And so we can sort of assume that Orca was his second attempt at outgrossing Jaws. And unfortunately for yeah. him, it opened against Star Wars. <laughs> it did not, really? It was like, I, I, you know, it wasn't the exact same weekend, but uh, yeah. Oh, it, no. It opened with Star Wars in theaters, so um, yeah, didn't work out. I don't know if De Laurentiis ever tried to do Star Wars. I don't think he did. I think he stuck with the animal thing. Um, <laughs> but because it was De Laurentiis, a uh, thing that a lot of people don't know is that it's really an Italian movie, so that's kind of my... I kind of wanted to cover this one, not just because it's a very weird movie, but because I could I could chat a little bit about my uh, uh, beloved Italian exploitation guys. And I'm going to ah. I'm going to mess up some names real bad here. I'll, I'll just warn <laughs> I'll warn everybody that I, I do. I, 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 I always mess up Italian names. But I'm really going to mess them up here. But uh, this was co-written and co-produced by Luciano Venzioni who, according to legend, called De Laurentiis in the middle of the night after seeing Jaws and told him, we need to find a fish that's tougher and more... I'm sorry, other way around. De Laurentiis called him in the middle of the night mm -hmm. after seeing Jaws and said, we need to find a fish that is tougher and more terrible than a shark. So... <laughs> okay. He asked his brother, who was, I guess, a, a biologist of some kind, and his brother mm -hmm. replied, killer whale. I mean, fair, <laughs> fair. Killer whales are pretty badass, and they do kill sharks, especially great whites. So and you, were, you were talking about how we're like um, good timing on a lot of what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. This is an excellent timing because we just have this uh, this this epidemic of of killer whales taking down yachts. Yes, and it's, yes, it's really funny. <laughs> And I, the things I was reading said that they're pretty sure the killer whales are playing, that it's not necessarily that they're um, bothered by the boats, but that they have, okay. they're, they're doing it for fun. Yes, they're doing it. I, I think an article you sent me said that they speculate that they're doing it because they like the feel of the wake from the propellers on their face. And so when the boats stop, because they don't want to, you know, <laughs> injure the orcas because they're so close they get mad because like a cat they're not getting what they want anymore <laughs> somebody turned off the laser <laughs> yes the... somebody turned off the laser the mouse is no longer working what is going on yeah it's so funny <laughs> it's so funny and then so they're becoming like these um folk heroes to to the uh the the 
the proletariat <laughs> taking down these big rich people yachts. It's very funny all around. I mean, I'm I'm here for that. Yeah. I'm here for that. But I also love how also in the article it was like, well, we can't, you know, we can't say for sure that that's what they're doing. And I'm like, no, no, come on now, come on. <laughs> Let, let's let's give them that, please. They're, they're such apex predators that they get bored. Um, that's always like I think a sign mm-hmm. of major, like especially, and and they they just don't run out of food. They're not like polar bears where they're like in dire straits. Like, right, they're just bored. Whales are bored. <laughs> bored uh, killer whales are bad for yachts. <laughs> yeah, it's very funny. <laughs> but so anyway, um, I should say Anderson, the guy who directed this. Uh, he he was a very good director, but he mostly made mediocre movies. Mm-hmm. And this included the 1956 Around the World in 80 Days, which got him nominated for Best Pic- uh, Director and won Best Picture, kind of famously one of the yeah. not not very good Best Picture winners. They kind of won because it was super popular. But it's gotcha. still a real movie, Best Picture movie. And it's worth noting that the year before Orca, he directed Logan's Run, which oh. is, I think purposely campy. This one feels accidentally campy. <laughs> It's always hard to yeah. judge. Like I don't want to. I I I have I haven't spoken to any of these people, so I don't know what they were aiming to do necessarily. But this one feels like it was an accident, whereas mm-hmm. Logan's Run is kind of built around being flashy and silly and 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 sort of over the top. Uh, but you know, you, you kind of could see part of Logan, especially the photography is kind of frosty for for no mm-hmm. apparent reason. Um, you can see connections there once you know they're there. It's it's mm-hmm. it's kind of there. The other thing that they can hide behind and say this is not a Jaws ripoff is that it does have a lot in common with Moby Dick. Ah, uh, yes, another a book that I tried to read as a child and threw against the wall and went, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, no, no, definitely not. <laughs> no, that's a very wordy book. Um, basically, Moby Dick is like like itself as a story. It, does have something in common jaws dead I, i'm sure peter benchley and spielberg would both call moby dick a somewhat of a uh, inspiration especially with the quiz. Oh, sure and the the script itself was co-written with uh sergio donati so this is another aside just for me um and he's credited and uncredited writing some of my all-time favorite spaghetti westerns like co ah. he did for a few dollars more he did the the big gun down face to face uh, duck you sucker and the greatest western ever made uh once upon a time in the west but that has like eight writers so who knows how much he actually did on that. <laughs> sure. um, but so so it, it's it, it has interesting people it's got a good solid director it's produced uh, producer was kind of up and coming and could get a budget behind him and the two writers have a decent history there's also a note that is very strange to me that chinatown and Mission Impossible and Less Detail writer Robert Town did a script doctoring pass at this. Um, he oh. actually he just passed away, I think, last week as of this recording. Oh wow! Um, but I think this is really weird because there is no snappy dialogue in this movie. <laughs> no, uh, no. <laughs> there's there's nothing snappy. For. And that's what he's known for is like clever dialogue and and like that kind of noir edge that he brings things. But I don't see any of that there. Uh, yeah no. <laughs> no so oh and then and then uh, and also a note to this uh i've seen more than one website claiming that this is based on a novel by arthur herzog the oh. third but it, it appears to me that that is actually a novelization of the film that was just oh, interesting released, it was released first in some territories so i think there's confusion there I, i'm almost positive that that's the case that this was an original screenplay that this guy wrote the you know the novelization which was a big big bigger thing it still happens today but but it was a much bigger thing in the 70s and 80s sure i mean i i'm not sure why this needed a book but that's okay <laughs> maybe the book is better maybe it like maybe the book is better. it internalizes the 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 struggles that the characters are having and stuff like that you can i sure hope so yeah <laughs> Um, and you probably are going to say this, but I was really impressed by the fact that they got Ennio Morricone yes. to do the soundtrack, which is really just, it's a 
the soundtrack's I think one of the best things about this movie. It's very maybe maybe the best thing about the movie. Right. It's just to me it was really haunting and then really fit for like the intense scenes that you do have. So mm-hmm. I don't want to like delay you from from talking more, but I was no, really no. so super impressed with the soundtrack. And that's something I should remember because that connects also to the Italian heritage of the film is that you know Marconi had worked with. Uh, uh, Dino De Laurentiis before, and he worked with these writers, obviously, on like for, for a few dollars more, and and Once Upon a Time in the West, uh, and and also you have to give Morricone uh, a, a lot of respect for not ripping off uh, John Williams. There's very yeah. little little uh, relation to Jaws in the soundtrack, which is definitely not something we're going to come across. <laughs> Almost all these movies, like because because you can't resist it. I don't know. I. Right. I I'm not I'm not a, a composer, but I do know how I do write songs and stuff. And I don't know how I could resist not doing the do 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 do. It's just so perfect. Yeah, it's so iconic. Everybody tries to find their own version of it where they just change the notes, but still do the the same basic structure. It's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he just took it and really just kind of made it his own. And I was just yeah, I think one of the soundtrack is probably the best thing about the movie yeah, it's really but nice. i was also really super impressed when i was looking at the cast i'm like okay bo derrick yep charlotte rampling richard harris will sampson scott walker who are all really well-known actors or if you're like me you know them when you look them up right well uh this was um the bo derrick thing is is from what i understand uh bo derrick was sort of the child bride of one of, of of this guy who was her manager and this and he mm. was just sort of there's a very disturbing i'm not going to get into thing about bo derrick's life as a young model and actress but this was an attempt to get her into movie star uh status doesn't really work in this one she was in the movie no. a little bit after but um it does in retrospect give it like an even better cast because now we all know who both right are. and i mean it's not her fault no, 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 <laughs> it's not, not her fault that the and, movie is what it is and i mean richard harris um i think most listeners of a certain age were a little bit older than you and i but uh they know him as the first dumbledore i right. think um but he had just starred in robin and marion he had just been in the cassandra crossing the same year as orca he was in wild geese which is a big war epic People like to talk about this being a downtime in his career, but uh, he was still making big movies. It is, he was notoriously an alcoholic, and I think mm-hmm. that actually helped him in this case, because this is a very sad character. Oh, absolutely. Um, a lot of the movie is just about him feeling guilt. Um, I, it I guess really the, is. <laughs> the thing that the, we can go back to the cast, because I think we actually need to set up the guilt part. Um <laughs> I remember, so so you were just, before we started recording, said you remember watching this movie on, like, TV. Yes, so somewhere between the ages of probably 8 to 12, you know, you have your local cable station. Right. And they were playing this movie, and the beginning of the movie is really beautiful. It's got these orcas, they're frolicking, they're happy. So, of course, as a child, I'm like, this is going to be great. Yeah. (laughs) And then you get about 20 minutes into the movie and it just turns into a trauma bomb and so I remember watching this and being like oh my god this is awful I don't even know if I actually finished the movie I might have just stopped it there um but I just remember being like this is this is awful what what is this and so when you were like hey let's watch Orca I was like okay (laughs) all right but I I always remember the video box when I was a kid, because because I remember going to early video stores and mm-hmm. like back in the days when there's beta and VHS and bringing my mom something and her telling me no that's beta take it back we need VHS <laughs> right and I just remember the cover for this which is one of the older posters it was really scary because I was I had Shamu fever as a little uh, right. I was born in 1980. And uh, we were, you know, Tucson's not too far from San Diego. So we would actually mm-hmm. go to SeaWorld. You know, we're going to talk about, uh, I'm sure we'll talk about later how SeaWorld fucking sucks. And we know that. <laughs> but at yes. the time, it was like 
the shit and I had stuffed animals and everything. So the idea right. that Shamu, because I knew the word killer whale, but I was always told, oh, it's a misnomer. You know, don't worry about it. Right. But the idea of Shamu hunting humans, that's what the <laughs> image was. Uh, that scared the crap out of me. And then and then years later, I'm pretty sure I saw this on TV the first time too. I was probably a li- I was probably a teenager at the time. I thought I, I thought it would be like Jaws and it would be about a killer whale that decided, hey, people taste good. Because that could happen. I don't right. think I don't think it has ever happened, but it could happen. We could run into a killer whale that decides people taste better than seals. And it would be very easy for them to take out a bunch of people. Especially because oh, they're absolutely. In- I mean, Jesus, it would be bad. If the killer whales decide to attack us, it would be bad. We're screwed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it would. I mean, it, God, I'm thinking about it now. And they, they would have to send out the army. Like, like it would be bad for the whales, too. Like, thank God they're not doing this because they would. Anyway, I'm, I'm getting off a tangent. A movie that, <laughs> movie that doesn't exist. <laughs> so this movie is about a guy, the Richard Harris character, the, as they mentioned, Irish. He's sort of Quint-esque. Yes, and not, it's obvious he's meant to be. Yeah, he's supposed to be sort of a mix of Quint and Brody, I suppose. Mm, um, yeah. They actually have a character that Keenan Wynn plays, uh, who's a sort of old character actor. Um, and his character is more like Quint, mm-hmm. and he gets killed very early on. And I think that is distinctly a, look, we killed Quint right away. This is serious shit kind of uh, situation oh interesting that's the way I've, I've taken that um he's like the he's not the i don't know what his job is on the boat but it's like we got richard harris a young guy keenan win and uh then bo Derek for some reason <laughs> yes because you i mean you gotta have you know you gotta have a pretty lady who's helping out on the boat i mean we are recording this directly after patrick and i recorded the thing about the 1957 horror movies or, or monster movies where there is always a a woman there's like a, a token yep. woman. There's sometimes more than one, but it's always the token woman. And yeah, uh, there's a token. Which are, oh, actually, there's two token women in this movie. Now that I think about it. One of them is a victim and the other one is uh, a love interest is, I guess, more. It's and the very, expert and the expert, very, you know, I wasn't um, sure who Bo Derek's love interest was supposed to be even on this. I think I've seen this movie three or four times and I, I'm pretty sure she is the Will Sampson character's love interest and not um richard harris's but i'm not positive because the charlotte ramp ramping character comes rampling character comes in later yeah i think bo derrick is uh, is she's the love interest of the other guy that's like the navigator on the boat okay um not the captain the navigator whose name is escaping me and i think i think will sampson is the gentleman who's like the i'm not sure what his yeah he's another guy who's job is not clear <laughs> peter, right besides peter, being the wisdom peter hooten is in it uh, that that might be who uh he's sort of like a filler brody yeah peter hooten is the actor ah uh, okay anyway so uh, uh, richard harris is uh I, I, you know his his motivation's weird um he's trying to capture a uh live capture a uh, killer whale mm-hmm. and the one he captures <laughs> is a, a female that is pregnant yep. and she and she decides to uh abort her fetus on his deck out of i don't know i don't think this is a thing that most animals do <laughs> probably not but also i get now that i'm an adult looking back at it be like okay we're supposed to find that this is tragic for our main orca and yep. we're supposed to be like oh humans were the worst so yeah. I get it, but also, you know, forty-seven-year-old me is also like, this is still awful. Well, <laughs> Why? I, I I think that's the Italian influence. I think that the Italian film industry is in the midst of a horror. It's on the verge of a horror renaissance where a lot of gory movies are going to come out. So I think that to them saying, "Oh, the orca you accidentally killed was pregnant," wasn't enough. They had to have this visceral. <laughs> horrible image (laughs) and it is horrible for anybody who's not seen this movie it is it is horrible and it's like in slow motion yeah it's a spontaneous abortion of a bait it's weird um and it's only this is a pg movie i think it's another (laughs) thing to mention there wasn't a pg-13 at the time but even by the standards of this oh there's spooky thunder outside that's kind of cool (laughs) timing 
even by these standards, this feels like an R-rated movie to me. I guess there's no nudity and no curse word, like hard curse words. So that... Right. <laughs> but but the part that makes it darkly comedic is that the male whale sees this happen and he lets out mm-hmm. a cry. Um, that's like a, a you know a classic no. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a whale, and they don't do that, and so it's just going. <laughs> don't do <"No!"> that. <laughs> And so it is sort of, it's 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 darkly comedic. It's and 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 Richard Harris' character immediately knows he's fucked up. Is the other thing that happens. right? Unlike Quint, he immediately knows. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, and he feels guilty. And so a lot of the movie is him feeling like trash, and then this whale yes. hunting him down. Uh, yes. And, and he's trying to hide, and the whale's fucking up the um, <laughs> the the marina where he's trying to hide. So everybody's like, "You need to leave." So it's basically. Yes. It's not jaw. It's it, it's not really Jaws with the killer whale, but it's Death Wish, and 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 the killer whale is the uh, uh, what's his name character. Did, he's the one whose family's been killed, and he's going out with his oh, right. magnum to shoot all the bad guys. I had it as, in, in my notes as like Jaws with an agenda. <laughs> yeah, you know, and it's like they make this really big deal about putting. The, an image of the captain into the whale, the orca's eyes, and was like, okay, he's got you. He knows who you are, and he's now going to come for you, yeah. no matter what you do. Yeah. Oh, I just remembered. It's Robert Carradine who plays the, the young guy. No, ah, okay. I just remember. Yeah, so 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 uh, the Revenge of the Nerds guy, the, the youngest Carradine, is, uh, is the, the guy. <laughs> And, oh, and Charlotte Rampling's character was oh, Charlotte Rampling, who I think people uh, will uh, immediately now know as the Reverend Mother in the Dune movies. Oh, um, right. And so she is like Bo Derek's uh, model and a very attractive woman. But Charlotte Rampling ha- at this at this point in time is like this stunning woman. Just absolutely the stunning. Icy eye woman. And uh, it's it's funny because she's basically Hooper. Yes. And she's not our first sex. She's our first, but not only sexy Hooper that we're going to be talking about. Here. <laughs> yeah. Some reason some people decided <laughs> Hooper, but sexy, and maybe a love interest. In this case, she's the right. love interest, but it is a not a believable. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> like because she because she's purposely trying to stop them the whole movie. I don't know why she even goes along. To tell you the truth. The, the last act mm-hmm. doesn't really make any sense. Uh, no, and she is the narrator of our entire story. Yeah. From the beginning to the end. Like, she yeah. is the only one who knows everything that happens. It's like, I don't know, is she writing a book after all this, I guess? A tell-all. <laughs> I mean, it would be a good book if you actually survived this, but nobody would believe you. The, yeah, the setup uh, is, is, you know, it's decent. It starts okay. And, oh, oh I should say the real, the real shark footage that they use... Uh, because they have to have a scene where it not only does our yes. quint die, but we have to have a scene where a shark dies because, again, right. this is better than that. But Ron Taylor um, yep. did the photography of the real shark, which uh, he's – we talked about him in the Killer Shark episode, I believe. Yeah, we did. Shark episode. Yeah. I mean, it's – I actually – I looked that up. I watched the credits, and I was like, yeah, of course it is. Yeah. And I think it's really – it's like a good note to say that this is – only coming out two years after Jaws yeah, and it's definitely using like the underwater footage you know of the shark and I would say that they also had underwater footage of actual orcas Mm -hmm. you know doing stuff and that use of real footage interspersed with of with props and stuff Mm -hmm. really is a theme throughout the other few movies we watch too like yeah that that whole like we're going to lend credibility and authenticity to this by using an actual video of this animal, um, which originated in Jaws. So Mm -hmm. it's definitely something that other people picked up on when, yep, we're going to take that too. (laughs) Yeah. And, 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 and I should say that the, uh, the Charlotte Ramp, uh, Rampling's character, the scientific uh, speech, the sort of info dump she gets Mm-hmm. It for the time was pretty accurate. I think it's still pretty accurate, and and they do go out of their way to say orcas aren't villains. 
And I think that, I think that that there's that shows a little, uh, you know, that's such a respectful thing that this movie does is it is it's not just that it's Death Wish with a, with a, I don't, Death Wish Death Wish with a fish sounds good, but Death Wish <laughs> doesn't work now. Um, that that like we're we're supposed to kind of hate Richard Harris and that yep. and we're supposed to think the orca's in the right. Correct. And then on top of that, we have a, the scientist character is telling us, yeah, though this this character this this creature would not be attacking us if uh, we hadn't done this horrible thing uh, that I that I by the way warned you not to do. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes, it, she warned him so many times, and I've I also had a note that unlike Jaws, the entire community is on the side of this orca yeah. <laughs> and against the captain. In wrestling, I watch a lot of wrestling, there's a chant that when someone does a move or says something that doesn't go the way they intended and they end up getting beaten up, the fans will chant, you deserve it. <laughs> and that's what the fishing community and we as the audience, I think, is supposed to feel like, you messed up, you deserve this, fix it. <laughs> yeah, they're basically like, you need to leave because that that very intelligent whale is specifically, he there's a scene where the whale blows up, like sets up a chain yes. reaction, and that blows is so up great. a. Uh, I guess it's like a, a, a fuel uh, reserve. Yes, a po- some kind of power plant or something that's easily flammable from yeah. down the hill. The shots where the whale is breaching after it destroys things are my favorite shots in the entire movie. Oh, they're great. They're great. They're beautiful. Uh, the, Ted Moore is the photographer. He did some of the Bond films. It's a beautifully mm. shot movie. But um, there's just this sort of joy in it. And uh, you can see that it's been um, spliced, that it's like footage of a real whale kind of uh, spliced into this this model or matte painting that they have. But it's just, it's just a yeah. great... And it's just fun watching the whale go, yeah, eat it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. I was just going to say, I... Did not feel actually that the orca rampaging was long enough. I wanted no. more raging and more like people getting eaten um, because it does this very weird thing where after the horrible trauma <laughs> happens and after the orca sets everything alight, it goes into this really odd philosophical old man and the sea kind yeah, that's, of. That's the Moby Dick part to me. But I, I guess he doesn't hate the whales, so that doesn't quite... You're right, Old Man in the Sea is almost the better literary uh, connection there. And it just drags at that point on. It, I have a note that said the middle of the movie is really boring. <laughs> right, and it is, because you're like, okay, we've had this horrible thing happen. Now we've had, you know, people getting eaten, and this orca is going to mess things up, and then all of a sudden it switches to this existential you are my destruction, I am your destruction <laughs> kind of thing. There's also a thing where there's been an accident and Harris's pregnant wife was killed by a drunk driver. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And so that's like, a, oh, he really understands what it's like to have a pregnant partner die. But it's like, you know, he already <laughs> understands. We all understand the whale <laughs> The whale shot its baby out on, on the deck. Like, it was, yes. and, and, and there's that you know, to to the sound of Ennio Morricone's most tragic music, like it, we get it. We didn't. Need that. <laughs> also, why weren't you driving your pregnant wife to the hospital? Yeah, Jerk. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But yeah, I had noted that. I was just like, wait, this is not the movie that I thought I was getting. <laughs> there's I thought a, I was getting more. There's a funny, well, again, darkly funny, kind of behind the scenes story. That is uh, is entirely hearsay, but it's believable if you know mm-hmm. anything about Richard Harris. But the uh, the well, not only was he drunk and hung over the whole time, which again I think actually kind of maybe made his performance better because he's already uh, in a bad shape. But it could make the character worse. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but there was a tabloid image of his wife and younger man that he saw while on set, and it sent him over the edge. Oh, he uh, apparently told crew members that he was going to leave the set, fly to Malibu and kill them both. And he got uh-huh. in a, he got in a literal fist fight with with Vincent Vincent Zoni over this, the producer, co-writer. Uh, and that was what stopped him and is the producer, the co-producer basically beat him up until he stopped wanting to leave set to go, to go do murder. 
Whoa. And then on top of this, he apparently insisted on doing all his own stunts, seemingly well drunk. Oh. And these are Italians in the 70s, so they're not going to stop him. I mean, this is the right. height of the Italian, uh, what we call the Polizio Tesci uh, movement, which is these really violent cops and robbers kind of movies that had these spectacular stunts that they would just do. They wouldn't plan them out. They'd just do them. So they're not going to oh. stop him. And uh, <laughs> they aren't very good stunts, I should add, but they are dangerous. And so the, uh, the, the ending of it, takes place uh in in this sort of it's supposed to be the polar ice cap but it's very clearly yeah. a set. it's it's one case where the budget did not help them they do not it does not look like the actual pol- it just looks like a no, set. no it's it's yeah it's so true it's um, very true <laughs> but apparently he got hurt and almost killed doing some of the stunts where he's fighting the whale on the uh sort of piece of ice that's floating yeah away. oh wow that's <laughs> That's interesting because the whole piece of ice and I will say when the orca tips the piece of ice over, I was like, OK, we're going to get him eaten no, it's, right, it's, right now. It's like the orca. Up as, as Quint getting pulled into the shark. Yeah, yeah. Right. But that doesn't happen. No, 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 that doesn't happen. And I, I mean, I did. I was watching it. And I was like, well, it's nice to see ice caps that probably no longer exist. <laughs> that's true. Because of climate change. Yeah, uh, uh, that's that's a weird side note. Is friend of the show who we just recorded. Like, this is this weird thing that's happening that this year ended up being the year of the monster movie uh, mm-hmm. and the killer animal movie on genre grinder. I didn't mean for this to happen, but I just did a killer animal mo- uh, episode with uh, my friend Ariani, and we actually covered. Uh, Razorback, which is absolutely Jaws, but with a pig. But I wasn't sure. <laughs> I, I was going to save it for this episode, but I decided that, that it would be she would just get a kick out of it. So I give. But she was just in Greenland doing a thing, and I got all these pictures, and I said, "Oh my god, you're so lucky to see this shit when it's still there." <laughs> right, right. I, I guess I don't have. I, I actually wanted to talk about uh, b- to wrap this one up, kind of mm-hmm. with um, talking about orcas and what we know about them now. I was going to note that a lot of people remember this movie as the movie where an orca eats Bo Derek's leg. Which <laughs> Do they te- really? Yeah, it doesn't technically happen <laughs> like that, but that is, y- y- you read a lot of reviews like from the er- er- era that like are looking back and reviewing something else and yeah. remembering orca, and that's what the critic who doesn't, you know, it's the 70s, he doesn't have access to IMDb to like right. double check these things. He's like, yeah, the movie where the orca eats Bo Derek's leg. <laughs> 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 I thought that was funny, but... um that's that's great there there's footage of wild whales there's footage of some pretty good fake whales i think way i think killer whales are pretty easy to fake because they're they're like matte black Mm -hmm. and as long as they look moist and you're not trying to focus on their eyes if you're just focusing on like the top of their head and their fin you could do a pretty convincing fake whale i think i i i agree i do i don't know if you noticed but i noticed there is a scene where the bereaved orca pushes his now dead mate onto the shore, like right in front of this guy's yeah. fishing cabin. And there's a scene where uh, the captain and Charlotte Rampling's character and one of the local fisher union people are talking. And you can see in the background, the whale moves a little bit. <laughs> It's yeah. still it's still stranded on the beach and dead. But I also, for some reason, that actually made me really happy because after seeing the horrible like aborting the fetus on the boat, yeah. to see that this whale is just like I'm alive still, I'm alive. <laughs> I was like, okay, I, I feel much happier now. <laughs> um, we can actually look back on um, the exact. These are from. The real orcas were in marine land of the Pacific in the L.A. area and marine oh. world Africa, which is now called Six Flags Discovery Kingdom. Marine land in the day. So, again, the movie Blackfish came out and we all learned right. about a uh, captive orca named uh, Tilikum, who <laughs> essentially went insane and killed at least three people on three separate occasions. Oh, yeah, that's right. And then we also know that, like, I, I remember watching a documentary where... Um, particularly foolhardy uh, documentarian theorized that the killer whales that was, it was, they were doing a documentary about how killer whales partially beached themselves to get seals. Mm-hmm. And a guy went and stood in the surf because he thought, <sighs> he said, there's no way the whale's going to attack me. And he That's was right. So dumb. 
he was right, but it was very stupid. But the footage, he has a camera down by his feet, and the whale comes up with its mouth open, sees the human legs, and just stares at them for a little while, and then goes back into the water. So he he was right, but it was a very stupid thing to do. <laughs> the whale could have accidentally ripped his legs off and then gone, ew, gross, and then swam away, which is usually how sharks kill people. Right, um, right, exactly. Like, you weren't what I wanted, ew. Yeah, so, but, so we know that these, that, that, we know two things that, that killer whales will go out of the way not to eat people unless mm-hmm. they've been, but they will murder people if they've been driven insane. We know, and we know SeaWorld right. is, is a hell, a hell pit, but Marine land at the time of SeaWorld, I remember as a kid who loved SeaWorld, we weren't allowed to go to any of the Marine land parks because no. my parents had heard all the horror stories about how awful they were. So they oh, were like, wow. they were like what we think of sea land or SeaWorld now Marine, Marine world, uh, Marine land was like, 10 times worse and then then, then my parents refused to ever even take me there because they had such bad press oh wow but uh, but that's where they filmed the live dolphins their names were um nepo and yaka oh and so i i didn't that's all i got i don't know how long nepo and yaka lived they were probably moved around a lot because marine lands tended to close Mm. but uh you know they have some you know they, they they seem to be having a good time they seem to be enjoying themselves <laughs> um i can't remember if if we see if they if the real footage if they have the floppy fins which is uh the dorsal fin which is a sign of depression apparently yeah there are some shots i think at the beginning where it's there the fins are deaf i noticed i was like well, that's a kind of flopped if over fin kind of was like ooh. (laughs) yeah so you know um they probably weren't super happy creatures and we know that now and it's a bummer um and it is that is one thing about you can't train sharks no (laughs) your your killer shark movies always have either stock footage Mm -hmm. or fake sharks they don't film with real sharks (laughs) No, I mean, there's, I think there's some sharks that you can, you know, from a young age, if you bait train them, you can get them to do certain things like maybe come when you, you call or something, but that's still nowhere near the level you need for a a movie or for anything like that. Well, I know that very recently they figured out, um, tiger sharks will, um, you can just put, uh, gently push their nose and they'll go away from you. And most of the scuba divers figured this out recently. Mm. I was just watching a thing on that, 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 that when they bite scuba divers, it's because they're trying, they basically use their mouth as hands. Yes. And that all gently push their nose away and they just go, oh, okay. So maybe, yeah, I mean, I guess you could, but it's not the same as a whale where you can train it to do all sorts of things. And so, yeah, there is, there is a darkness behind the scenes in this story that, that we know these two whales are probably not happy, but they, for all, they don't put them, you know, it's an Italian movie. Fortunately, it's an American co-production because Italian, uh, we're not known for not killing animals for, we actually, Patrick and I just talked about this on the monster. Oh episode. no. <laughs> yeah. The Italian, there's a whole something you don't need to know about, but there was a, a series of, of shockumentaries called Mondo movies and then a series of cannibal movies that would have been starting around this time and lazy Italian filmmakers would just kill animals because it's cheaper than making a special effect. And so oh. if this had been a completely <laughs> Italian production, uh, it might have been much worse. They might have actually been using real whales and making them do bad stunts instead of using f- fake whales for the bad stunts oh my god and then so, i'd be even know, more traumatized exactly <laughs> exactly <I> now? <laughs> so for for what it was worth these whales were as well treated as whales would be in captivity in 1977 mm-hmm. I, I think it's the best way we can put it <laughs> yes uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna agree with that um, but that's all I have to say about Orca the Killer Whale, which is just, it's its a unique movie. It's not a good True. movie. No. Um, <laughs> but the ways it's bad are kind of interesting. If you think you can handle how depressing it is, mm. um, I actually recommend people seeing it. Just be prepared to being weird and depressing and just like kind of marveled that, that major money went into such a bizarre film. Yes. And, and that of all the jaws without the shark movies we're going to cover this is like the least jaws like even though it is a sea monster movie 
It's true. It's it's very true. And I mean, if nothing else, look up the soundtrack because it yeah. is a haunting. It's yeah. haunting and, and actually beautiful and f- far more than you th- than this movie actually kind of deserves, in my opinion. <laughs> That's the case with a lot of Neil Morcone soundtracks, honestly. Uh, sometimes he is uh, quite often the best thing about the movie. Okay, so we'll move on. The second one is one uh, is a personal favorite, Alligator from 1980. Ah. This is directed by Louis Teague, who uh, got the Cujo gig because Stephen King liked this movie a lot. Oh, really? Yeah. So this is, instead of a strange, inadvertently funny attempt to make a Jaws-like thriller, this is a purposely funny comedy that uh, I would mark among, uh, you know, the smallest of movies that works as a comedy and a horror movie pretty well. Usually, Mm -hmm. if you have a comedy horror movie, you really lean into one or the other. Right. You have something like Scream that is funny, but is really a horror movie. Or you'll have something like Gremlins, which is uh, has some horror moments, but is really mostly funny. Mm -hmm. This, This is sort of a nice balance, I think. Um, and I, I, I think I revisit this every five years or so. Um, I just I like it a little bit more every time I see it. And it's it, I, it's not really a full on spoof of Jaws. No. But it's funny because the guy who wrote this, John Sayles, who is more famous than Louis Teague in, in the long run. Um, John mm-hmm. Sayles had already written a popular, well-made and funny Jaws spoof directed by the director of Gremlins. Joe Dante was called, really it was called Piranha. And Piranha is just a flat-out spoof of Jaws. Oh, um, I remember Piranha. Yeah. I remember and, that one. And that's a funny and good, but it's not as good as this. This has so much mm-hmm. more character that this is the one I prefer. And I think he got this gig off the strength of that that particular movie. But he was, this time he's like, okay, I can do a Jaws ripoff, but I can like have more character to it. And I can, I can say something. You know, mm-hmm. Piranha is just a silly movie. This, this movie has, has, has a theme of um yes. and you know it's 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 about animal oh i should read the i should read the um <laughs> i should read what 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 letterbox uh claims is the plot here which is a baby alligator is flushed down the toilet and survives by eating discarded lab animals that have been injected with growth hormones now gigantic animal escapes the city sewers and goes on a rampage pursued by a cop and a big game hunter i mean it's a simple plot but yes yeah. it is a there's a whole thing about um, animal testing. This, yeah, yeah. Which which makes it a good um, killer animal movie because those are often about man's hubris and uh, you know bad scientific practices coming back to bite them. Yes. Yeah, I'd forgotten that testing on animals super okay back in yeah <laughs> back yeah. in the late 70s 80s i'm like oh forget about that i mean i'm just old enough to remember when uh makeup started going out of its way to advertise that it was not tested on animals and mm-hmm. i i think that was almost that was probably the 90s i want to say early 90s late 80s when they were finally mentioning that but um yeah there yeah. weren't a lot of rules there's a lot of, there's there's a movie called plague dogs that was based on a book written around the same time about do- a really depressing animated movie beautiful movie but so sad um about <laughs> two dogs that escape a um testing facility mm-hmm. where where the testing is just awful and and doesn't it's like nazi shit and and oh, gosh it, it's so it was definitely something on people's minds you know mm-hmm. And maybe maybe movies like this help change things. I don't know. Maybe some some uh, some politician somewhere saw Alligator and went, "Uh oh, did that really happen?" <laughs> I mean, it's a really entertaining, solid to me monster movie. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed watching this. You know, it's got the tropes, and you you probably will want to talk about it about like the cop with the tragic past. Yeah, the annoying reporter that's looking for the scoop. You know, the police chief who wants to help, but they have to follow orders. Yeah. You know, the mayor who wants to get rid of the problem quickly. And then you got to have the confident, experienced hunter who gets eaten. You yeah. You got to have that. Yeah. The, the, the mayor is definitely Jaws mayor esque. Mm-hmm. I, I don't remember that character's name. And then, yeah, the hunter is, is one of the more parody like elements. He's, yeah. It, it they, the most of the characters play it straight um i think uh, the the main character is played by robert Foss, forrester who um i think a lot of people know um from jackie brown 
Mm-hmm. Um, but he was he was in a lot of movies, uh, similar movies to this. He was kind of a B. He was kind of an A level talent working in B movies for a lot of his career. I think there's a whole like character thing. He had just gotten hair plugs, and he. Um, <laughs> He improvised a bunch of stuff about people asking people if it looked real and sales liked it so much they started writing more about that into the script are and you the, serious yeah and so and so i thought i always thought that 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 sales was making fun of him but it was like his idea apparently that is hilarious because i that is a, a thing and i just was like i thought too that also like they're just making fun of their leading dude what yeah is going on well and that plays into um Jackie Brown has a couple scenes where he's he's um, falling in love with Jackie Brown and he is looking at his hairline and feeling self-conscious about it. And this is the kind of movie Quentin Tarantino definitely would have watched and enjoyed. Mm-hmm. So, I, yeah, <laughs> the character is actually very similar. It's it's just a younger version of, of that character, like with a little more. But he still has that same sort of uh, low keyness about him. He doesn't, mm-hmm. you know, it's just he's he's just a a, a nice character that you want to be around. And his right. tra- his tragic past is um, I'm trying to remember. I believe the idea is that he keeps getting partners killed. <laughs> yes. So I I believe the first partner uh, they had responded to a robbery. The robber stole his gun and used it to shoot his partner. And then everybody makes fun of him because it's not reliable. And then in the movie we see that. Uh, he goes into the sewers with a partner and said partner gets chomped. So. Yeah. And so he's just like a bad luck guy. He is, he is a Brody S character, but only if Brody's life went really bad and he didn't, like, <laughs> you know, he didn't find a wife. Yeah. And, and, and in the case of Jaws, um, I, I believe that he has this, that going to um, Amity is, is supposed to be a up, you know, he's supposed to have gone up in the, this is a better job than the one he was working before. Right. Or this is the opposite, where he's been kicked down, um, <laughs> kicked down the ladder because he's just bad luck. <laughs> right, right. The uh, weird factoid here is that there's a, another writer uh, who is uh, credited, Frank Ray Perelli, and he is the one. Uh, he wrote a script that was then handed to Sales and entirely rewritten. So none of his stuff is here, oh. except for the idea. Of, but he has a contractually obligated that he is also credited. Hmm. Um, to me, this is funny because Sales had a situation where he wrote an unused... Uh, he wrote a script about... A horror-themed script about an alien visitor mm-hmm. that would then be taken and completely rewritten by uh, Melissa Matheson and Steven Spielberg and turned into E.T. Oh, Wow. So there was like, so he ended up in a similar situation. And I don't think in that case, sales is not credited, but there is always Mm -hmm. like this sort of notion that there was a horror movie version of E.T. that John Sales wrote at some point, and it just got completely changed. That's interesting. Yeah, kind of fun factoid. And yeah, so so something that Patrick and I were covering over and over and over again, this 1957 movie is the idea of people were afraid of nukes and radiation. Mm. And so... The idea that this movie is about um, pharmaceutical tampering causing right. the monster to become big is like it's like that's a very late seventies nineteen eighty thing is what I have a, a note down about here. So like the idea your monster is no longer a toxic waste monster or an, a radiated monster or some monster that you discovered by drilling too deep into the earth. You know, right? This is this is because you, you're disposing <laughs> of pharmaceuticals in the wrong way. And it plays into that alligators in the sewers yes. panic. You yes. Know, that, which was a real thing. Which was a real thing. It's true. I mean, people were buying alligators. And I, I don't I don't know about how many of them were actually flushed down the toilet. But there was a case of people buying their kids alligators and then going, oh, shit, this is going to get big. We better kill it. That was, that was a real thing that happened. <laughs> which is very kind of like what so the the scenes where in the beginning where this alligator is getting you know brought home and stuff and then goes through the toilet and stuff like that you're just kind of like i actually had to look it up and be like this didn't really happen right yeah i mean there was a yeah i i I don't think the flushing thing was real but the uh, the idea is always that it's been new york where this is the issue Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. weirdly this movie doesn't they i don't know where it takes place 
I think it's Detroit, isn't it? Well, okay, so there's part of it where the family at the beginning drives from Florida and they pass the Welcome to Missouri t- sign. That's right. But it was shot in L.A. and very much looks like L.A. If you've ever been to L.A., mm. these are what the L.A. storm sewers look like. Um, if you've seen any movie where there's a car chase in L.A., they end up in these sort of walk <laughs> areas. But then it's made to look like Chicago or Detroit, when, you know, one of the Midwest things. Mm -hmm. Um, And at some point, Foster's character says he was from St. Louis. So it's not St. Louis. So, like, my best guess is Kansas City. But I don't know if Kansas City has sewers big enough. I've never been there. But I don't know if they have sewers big enough for giant alligators. (laughs) I have Um, no idea. It's not important, but it's weird how it's it's obfuscated but also not entirely they keep giving us information so Mm -hmm. i guess my best guess is kansas city that's where i decided it takes place yeah it really is not clear exactly where you are but i guess it's supposed to do the stand-in for like everyday midwest city kind of thing so i don't think kansas city is too it's too off of a guess really but yeah it's clearly la it's it's very (laughs) course it's la yeah oh we, we could get back to the so we've talked about robert forrester um mm-hmm. robin Riker's character her character's name is marissa kendall mm-hmm. she is our second sexy hooper yes yes um but she's like a genuine love interest like there's 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 some like chemistry between the two of them oh absolutely orca's just too weird for for <laughs> yeah. a love interest to work or the people are too messed up in orca to actually have a, a meet cute they just yeah. are well, and I think that there is something interesting about peop- about screenwriters looking at Jaws and thinking that Hooper and Brody have to be a love interest because there is a <laughs> there's a platonic romance between those characters. They're like, right. like it's it. I don't. I wouldn't call that that movie particularly homoerotic, but there's definitely mm-hmm. like a genuine love that builds between those two guys. And the, and I think that's the part is I, I believe the story is that Hooper's character originally died and they changed it so that oh, he really? survived because uh, because they realized that it was such a strong connection. So I do think that's interesting that so many screenwriters are like, well, what if these two were a couple? <laughs> They're like the Burton Ernie of. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if there's like because again, there's, there's so many shark movies. But I wonder if there's one of these newer Jaws ripoffs where it is just a gay couple. That like like that would be an interesting gay romance. To, I would watch that. <laughs> yeah, have two men fall in love over uh, a monster attack. Like I, I wonder if that's ever been done. There's been there's been gay slasher movies, um, but I don't know if there's ever been a gay romance built around a monster attack. That, that would be fun. I would I would watch that. I'd yeah. I'd pay money for that too. <laughs> yeah, they should get, somebody should get that. Um, but the Quint is uh played by Henry Silva, who again is mm. like. He is the most parodied thing in the whole movie. He's absolutely, and he's having a great time. I love Henry Silva. Um, he also just died not too long ago, but he's always he always plays Henry Silva in everything he's in. He's, <laughs> he's in Dick Tracy, I think. Some well, no, that that's even an old movie. I don't know how old my listening audience is, um, but I first saw him in Dick Tracy as a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, as I can't remember which character he plays. It's the one with the weird forehead. That doesn't narrow it down. <laughs> oh i don't know my dick tracy very well at yeah all. and anyway he he's he's having a good time and uh he he has a bit quite a bit of screen time and then when yeah he dies it's like of course that was gonna happen but it's a great scene though yeah. like it, it's that cheesy like you're like yeah go alligator <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and it's also ill-equipped cops instead of ill-equipped amateur shark hunters, right. which which makes it more of an action scene than Jaws ever had. Most of the stuff in Jaws is just one little montage of guys going out on the water, and then later we see one captured the tiger shark. Mm-hmm. Um, this one is an actual like action scene, which, yeah, there's a couple scenes in this movie that really push the budget. Um, the... I think they, they use a real alligator for some shots, but they use it yeah. around... They used it around some pretty convincing models to make it look really big. I agree. Yeah, there were some scenes where I was like, okay, I know that's a miniature, but that's an actually really well done yeah. miniature. Um, and there, uh, the the finale where it just goes wild. It's somebody I just actually this isn't in my notes. I just read a thing that somebody pointed out that the um, an, another theme to this movie is the idea 
that the shark eats its way up the um, social ladder. So it starts eating <laughs> forest people. And at the mm -hmm. end of the movie, it's eating uh, rich people at a part at a, a wedding party. Oh my gosh. Yes. The, the, the wedding scene in alligator is the best part. Come on. It's the yeah. best part. The tail flick into the cake. Come on. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's bloody in that sort of comedically gory way. Right. But I thought that was, and that's definitely something that someone like sales would do on, but sales um, became, he's a very respected writer director these days. Um, I, uh, his best movie is um, a sort of neo-Western uh, sort of, of drama called Lone Star from 1996. Really mm -hmm. great movie. Uh, early, early Matthew McConaughey lead. And then he also did The Brother from Another Planet. He, he wrote that one, and, which uh, we covered, I covered a long time ago. We did a, um, on the Afrofuturism podcast, we talked about A Brother mm. from Another Planet. Uh, and he did Eight Men Out, which I believe was oscar nominated like he's he's a big name but he started in these sort of funny b movies mm -hmm. so i imagine that that whole thing of it the alligator eating its way up the social ladder was <laughs> planned that and it's just something i just never noticed until it was pointed out um and then yeah like that scene is violent slapstick but there yes. is one very scary scene in this movie that hit me in this irrational childhood fear um, really? where, where um, when you're swimming, you're always afraid that there's something in the water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of kids have this thing, but there's a scene where a kid is, is some sort of party is happening and a kid is forced right. onto a diving bar board in the backyard pool. Yep. And he's, and he's about to jump and, and the parent turns on the pool light and the yes. alligator has been resting in the pool the whole time. And it's such a, a, a like, like visceral, like, like, gets me on my lizard brain like fuck mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. and, and then it kills the kid the fact that the kid is eaten i mean i guess jaws has a child eaten and that's a big deal and the fact that a kid is eaten is sort of like a side moment it's not like a big you know scary set of, like or it's not like it's not like the thing that changes the whole trajectory yeah, of the plot. No. it's just something that happens no and then the kids are like mom <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> And I did also appreciate, I will say, the scene. there is a scene where um, the alligator is trying to go hide. And yeah. it comes up through a sidewalk and causes a car accident. And then, of course, the cars are on fire and yeah. the police officer is trying to get out of the car and he can't get out quick enough. And so this, this alligator is coming towards him, not particularly running. It's it's yeah. moving, and then he's just like, oh, I can't get out, and then he gets he gets eaten, and there's just all of this, you know, fire everywhere. I was like, this is actually a really well done, just kind of like fun, blow it up scene. Yeah, and I I, I don't think their budget was more than maybe a million dollars. Like it was mm. not a big budget movie, but it's not quite. It's a B movie. It's not quite like an, an, an indie horror movie, but you know, right. It's, it's pretty impressive what what uh, Teague pulls off. You can see why they gave him the Cujo job. Oh um, yeah, absolutely. He actually, he actually um, did a couple of not very good Stephen King uh, movies, like Cat's Eye. Um, he did one other one that I can't remember right now, um, but he uh, uh, Stephen King liked him a lot, and so there was that period in the '80s when every single Stephen King book had to be ad adopted adapted into a movie. Right. He, was, he did quite a few of them. My only other factoid is that a young Brian Cranston uh, did some of the special effects in this movie. No way. Uh, specifically said he was in charge of, of fake alligator intestines. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so. That's so neat. I'm, I am going to say something. So like yeah. for, for those of you who feel like your dog is like <laughs> your life mate and you love animals so much, you might want to skip this one. <laughs> yeah. I'm just so the, the first, I would say the first like 10, 15 minutes, it's necessary for the story, but if it might be something where if, if you really love animals, the talk about testing and the, the fact that somebody is throwing dogs into a sewer, you don't see the dogs. Yeah. But um, the remember, implication. You don't, you don't see any 
any dogs killed. No, absolutely not. Yeah. So but it's it's still implied and it can get yeah. a little squicky. So just yeah. just heads up for pet lovers. Just you've had you've been warned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it's it's tastefully done but uh yeah, it is it is dark. But otherwise it's a pretty lighthearted movie honestly. It's kind of like yeah, agree. Yeah, I I really enjoyed watching this one. I just was like, oh hey, yeah, this is a this is a solid monster movie, and I enjoyed it even more on my second watch. I always watch um, the movies two times: first to watch it, mm-hmm. second to take notes, and I thoroughly enjoyed it both times. So this, this was, was a one, winner to me. This was one where my partner Christine uh, closed the computer while we were watching it. That's how I know that she's in, <laughs> she's interested that she's into the she's into what's happening on the screen is that she wants to give it her full attention so <laughs> nice okay well then we can move on we can keep things going here um <laughs> so then the next one is another uh that i like uh more in concept than practice it's a movie i enjoy but uh mm-hmm. it, it's not as much fun but it's another comedy this is the lift or Dirt. right I um, loved this one this is my favorite of the entire was it? oh bunch. good oh good i'm happy i love this one it was this, a pleasure to me to watch this both times. <laughs> this is by Dick Herman Willem Maz, who just goes by Dick Maz. Um, this is 1983. It's Dutch. And this one is another just comedy. This is, mm. the, it, it, it does take the horror half pretty seriously. It's never as funny as Alligator, but um, that's a high bar. And also, right. uh, it does, the comedy is more in the, um, there's a couple like goofy scenes, but the comedy is more in just the situation, the Agreed. idea that you're having uh, Jaws, but it's an elevator, <laughs> a haunted elevator. The and elevator the tag- is hunting you at this high rise luxury yeah. hotel, luxury place. The, the, yeah. the tagline is, for God's sake, take the stairs. Is that really the tagline? It was in America, at least. <laughs> I guess, yeah, I guess I can't tell you what it was in a, in, in, in a, the <laughs> That's great. Uh, That's the, brilliant. The plot, as according to Letterbox, is a lift technician finds himself drawn into the web of mystery and peril as he investigates the perplexing, deadly accidents occurring in the elevators of a new office building. This is also a movie that uh, falls under a category that I might cover on John DeGrinder someday, which is high-rise horror, which for some yeah. reason is something that works for me. I don't know why, but I just maybe because I've never lived in a high-rise and the idea of living in a high-rise seems insane to me. Uh-huh. So, so it's just like i don't know i just i like the idea of, of bad things happening in a higher evil dead rise just came out last year i think it was. <laughs> that was that was great um good good example of it uh demons 2 another funny example of it so i'm gonna just set up who maz was here mm-hmm. i believe it's pronounced maz um i'm not i don't know dutch but um he was a music video guy which uh which uh we when we talked about razorback that was another music video guy it's kind of interesting these movies are made similar times they're both jaws without a shark mm-hmm. yeah russell mulcahy was the name of the uh the guy who did razorback he wasn't as famous as mulcahy who did uh uh he did like rio and uh uh hungry like the wolf for duran duran oh nice so he did some pretty but but um he uh, uh moss did uh videos for golden earring including uh, uh the video for twilight zone tripping into the twilight zone oh that, uh, okay yeah got, got you now this is the band uh I, I didn't realize that the band that performs the song radar love which is like the most americana ass classic <laughs> rock song about being a, a like a a, a, a long long tr- long range truck driver yeah. having having phone sex on your fucking cv like <laughs> the band that wrote that song is dutch that's insane i just assumed they were from alabama or something <laughs> that's crazy to me that's something else but anyway uh twilight zone was a little bit famous because it had a plot and music videos didn't tend to have plots and i believe it was banned i don't remember why i think it had a <laughs> moment of violence in it and it was not allowed on mtv at a certain point oh um, interesting so uh he's you know he's he, he, and he has that image too there's a movie he made after this that i adore called amsterdam about <laughs> a serial killer that's using the, the 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 amsterdam uh not causeway uh 
the waterways. I can't remember the name, what you call the water streets in Amsterdam. <laughs> He's using those and, and scuba equipment to go underwater and come up and kill people and then go back underwater so nobody can figure out where it is. Fantastic what? movie. Really great boat chase. But that's not what we're talking about now. But uh, Amsterdam. <laughs> I'll find a way to talk about Amsterdam someday. I don't know. I don't know what genre it falls under. But um, anyway, he, he has these very visually intriguing movies. And this... Mm -hmm. This one is, it, it looks kind of music video-esque. It has a little bit of that 80s kind of, there's a couple neon light rigs. There's some smoke, yeah. that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, as far as the comedy goes, it is pretty body when it gets down to it. There's a lot of <laughs> googly-eyed kind of perverts in this film. <laughs> <laughs> they're kind of, yeah, they're, they're, they're kind of are. It's true. It's the kind of stuff that you see in a lot of European comedies from this era. It's just definitely something that, that they were into. And like Orca, I remember this one from the video box when I was young. And it just seemed to be at every video store. I don't know why. Um, I didn't see it for years. You'd think it would be really obscure. This Dutch, not particularly well dubbed. Did, I can't remember. Did you, would, did you watch the dubbed English or the Dutch version? I watched the dubbed English version. Yeah, it's not a particularly convincing dub. <laughs> but Not uh, really, but I suspended disbelief. So. Well, yeah, and it actually kind of improves the vibe of it, I think. Uh, but it's just interesting that it, it was in every video store. And it has this great cover of a guy whose head stuck in the closing door. <laughs> and it's like, uh, yeah. Like, uh, what do you call it? Uh, 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 for Photoshop, we used airbrush. It's like this airbrush. It looks like an album cover, basically. It was a really cool box. But that's what I remember. It's so funny. The, um, it looks like the cover for the, the dubbed version, or at least the image that comes up when you like go to watch it, mm -hmm. is the elevator. And there's this little girl in her oh. pink dress with the doll standing yeah. there and so i was just like okay what yeah. am i gonna see but it the, definitely the comedy makes makes this movie just even better than just a straight up like computers are trying to kill you movie yeah yeah that's true it's also technically a techno horror movie that's it i was looking the other day i was like what is the way yeah. to describe this and techno horror is definitely it instead of like today's ai uh -huh. um you know ai is the big bad the big unknown we don't we know it has multiple uses but we don't know what it's going to do to us it's like oh microchips microchips yeah. are the bad guy back in 1983 and it's so interesting to see what people were afraid of mm -hmm. back you know so afraid that you're like making a movie to release the anxiety around this thing that you're like i don't know what's happening with this so the the idea here is that uh there's microchips that have some sort of like human or animal like i like stem cells attached to them for some reason or something it's like, like that they're like it's it's protein based yeah which i i don't know anything really about microchips or processing but i'm like really <laughs> yeah it's like the um it, the jaws connection and one of the major ones here is that the bad mayor is a bad ceo in this right. case and this building it's not just the elevator but the whole building it, it i don't understand how they're making money off this building but it's <laughs> It's very important that this building not be closed and the elevators continue to be put in use. Yes. Um, <laughs> I don't know how that works exactly, but um, there's a whole cover up and it just gets, it's like the, the lift, the, the elevator's computer system is self-aware mm -hmm. and, and it is a brain. Yeah. And it's like, it's really, it be, the climax is really surreal. Like, cause it right. just becomes it, it's still the jaws thing where it's you know mon, ma, mono not mono a mono showdown between the monster and the lead character but right. it's it's like it's sort of like a haunted house movie in a lot of ways mm. um and i guess when you make a movie about a haunted or or self-aware elevator it has to be sort of bizarre <laughs> you can't <laughs> you can't really sell that uh in a serious way I well, I should say that the 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 lead is played by Hoob Staple. His name is Felix, and he's definitely our Brody type. We don't yes. really necessarily have our Quince and Hoopers. Uh, well, but we I mean, 
we kind of do because there's a reporter that keeps bugging him for a story and keeps and That's they go true. and she is like I know something's up and you're just not telling me. And he's like, look, all I do is fix elevators. The electrical stuff is for the company that runs the big bad company that runs it. I don't do anything. Um, And the nosy reporter thing. um, I see in a lot of uh, uh, European thrillers at this mm -hmm. time, there's a Dario Argento movie called deep red, which the, the secondary lead is a woman who's a nosy reporter who has involved herself in this murder mystery. And I could see this movie has colors that are very similar to what you'd see in a Dario Argento movie. Because I, I could imagine that that was some somewhat of an inspiration for this particular role. But so I guess you're right. She is sort of our third sexy hooper. Yes, she 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 is because yeah. you know, and he also comes to her at one point in the movie because he's like Felix does to be like, I don't know what's going on with this building. I don't know what's going on with this evil corp that has yeah. you know done the electronics for this elevator. Yeah. Uh, spoiler alert: the evil corp is the one that's made the microprocessing chips that are taking over and becoming sentient and all that. But, you know, she is the one that's just like, I know something's up. Oh, and here's information on my company, you know, on this company from what the archives of my newspaper. So in a way, I think she is kind of like the Hooper or some kind of peripheral character to mm-hmm. to our to our Brody. <laughs> and then Felix. The, it creates this subplot that's not very good where um, his, his <laughs> wife, it's, it's it, he does have a like son and wife situation that's similar to Brody but she's convinced he's cheating on her with this Mm -hmm. woman and he's just not doing anything to dissuade her from that idea (laughs) it was like I was like you know you're in the 80s when you've got the kids at the dinner table the parents at the dinner table the wife is yelling at the husband about cheating and he's like kids just eat your dinner (laughs) yeah it's it's very frustrating he's just like (laughs) He could just explain this. He could introduce the two of them, you know? It's like... Right, this, right. And, I mean, there's not even... There's this <laughs> very slight indication that they that, that he wants to sleep with her, but it it's kind of goes away pretty quickly. Like, there's right. not a lot of them being a romantic uh, couple in no. there. They're a pretty platonic relationship. Very thoroughly platonic relationship. The guy, the detective in charge of the case, I think is a dragnet joke (laughs) yes he's supposed to be just dragnet um and he is sort of combining a brody and hooper thing and that he's well-meaning authority figure and he just rambles on factoids about accidents and kind of the way he would about sharks it's a kind of funny little character quirk and then Um, but in the same time he's far more interested in where he's going to take his vacation yeah. And his subordinate, who's like, shouldn't we care more about this, is like, he's like, nah. <laughs> nah. Nah, case closed. It's In fine. The, I also have a note, I forgot about this. The English dub, the um, the Felix's son is named Brody in the English dub. Oh, really? Yeah, I forgot about that, but I did make a note. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was just watching the movie and there's a scene where Felix is, you know, he's there and he's going to start trying to figure out what's going on. And he rolls up a cigarette and starts smoking it on the job. And I'm like, you know, it's the 80s when. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, just smoking. I mean, especially in Europe, that would have gone into the 90s, probably. I mean, the best jokes here are the fact that anything is happening in this movie at all. The, the best <laughs> joke is that there's this super complicated mystery behind this building. That's right. that's the best joke in the movie, and that they play it straight. Yes. Um, and uh, it wouldn't be as funny as if someone was pausing every few minutes to remark how absurd everything is. If you like, if you like, made a kind of Joss Whedon-y character that kept on, you know, saying what is going on, you know, that kind of yeah, story. that would not have worked. And I think you're right because it. It works, especially at the end where the the elevator uh, takes care of the evil CEO and, yeah. you know, justice is served <laughs> because the elevator, you know, decides to, to, to murder this person. It's just, it's a level of absurd that if there was a character being like, what is going on? I don't understand. It would have just ruined the entire... Um, the entire experience of yeah. of the movie 
the um the death toll is actually pretty low. Oh um, yeah. Me watching it, the the first scene, the sort of like setup, which is like, um, what is the character in Jaws's name? The first girl who dies. Oh, I don't know. I don't remember her name, but it's like that kind of setup. It's a bunch of really annoying, horny um, farmers. Like, They're farmers, <laughs> right? And 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 you'd think that like, oh, this is an a killer elevator. It's gonna you know guillotine people, which does happen. There is a guillotining. There is. Uh, you don't. It's not gory. Right. Um, um, or you just expect it would crash people, you know. Right. But this one, it it it, it tries to cook them to death by locking the door, <laughs> and it has yes. like control over the environmental. Uh, it, it's the, the writers get get creative right off the bat with the first attempt, and then but the people don't die is something I forgot. Nope. I thought that they died, but they do no, not. they just got taken to the hospital. Yeah. Um, they don't. They don't die, and the little girl in the poster doesn't die either. No. I was I was like, please don't show me this thing. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's just like it eats her doll's arm instead, and it's sort of teasing her by opening one door and then the other door. It's like it's playing with her, and in, yeah. and after you watch it the first time and she doesn't die, it's sort of playing. Like maybe maybe it's not trying to kill her. Maybe it's just being goofy, and we just as as a audience at that point in the movie think it's just a rabid animal that's going to murder everybody. Maybe it's just having a good time. There's, that's, that's possible. I think that that's supposed to be a little bit of a shining reference too, but there mm. is no war pouring out of it. It's really like, no, I think no. it's mostly rated R because there's nudity in it, but maybe there's not even nudity. Maybe there's just implied nudity. There's people like, and yeah, they, I don't think there's even any nudity. I mean, I was, I'm thinking about this movie. I do not remember any nudity at yeah. all. Um, there's a I lot mean, of people tr about like making out about to have sex when they like the CEO is cheating on his wife. Right. So. Okay. That's, that's, that's but true. It's still PG, PG 13, PG level stuff. It's kind of. Maybe yeah. for 1983, it was racy. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Um, the Amsterdam is a really gory movie, so uh, he had it in him to do something where I, he <laughs> definitely was not not doing it on purpose here. He's definitely going out of his way to uh, to be silly instead of violent. Yeah, and I think it works. It works for the elevator to to not be just pouring gore out. It works that it, it gives it an intelligence. Yeah. in a way that it can pick and choose it yeah. doesn't have to just you know m try to murder everybody um but you, i have to say you have to have so at the at the end when you ha we have our face off mm -hmm. um i do appreciate there has to be blue goo there has to be yeah. some kind of goo to, to let you know that this is not right that this this panel these things are the elevator is not okay <laughs> Because like there the is most, some kind of goo there. The most MTV esque thing in the whole movie is that right. that that lighting and the blue and the, the vibrancy of it. Yeah, for sure. Right, but I just found it just fun. Out of the the movies we watched, I was just like, this to me, that and the Alligator were just fun. It's just yeah. a fun movie that you're you're not expecting for it to be quite as good as it turns out to be there's something to be said for movies that understand that they're sort of ripping off jaws and that mm. they're gonna try to do it in a clever way right instead of movies that are just trying to cash in <laughs> or, like you know how this goes <laughs> yeah yeah and yeah like we like you said it's sort of a tech it's sort of a killer robot movie in a way mm. um and i think that there is an element of japan phobia that was a Oh. I always thought of as an American phenomenon. There was that corporate Jap Japanophobia thing that was going on that Japan was going to take over all of our electronics and all of our everything. Right. Because the, the evil company is, is called Rising Sun and they are a Japanese company. So oh, I, that's right. I totally missed that. I thought it was interesting because I always think of that as an American phenomenon. But I guess uh, parts of Europe were also experiencing that sort of dread that uh, Japan was just going to take over the whole of of electronics and corporate uh the corporate world at the time yeah. it, it it's not anti-japanese but it has that sort of vibe to it that's, that's that's probably that's probably as close as it gets to being i mean it is it is very um critical of the big corporation in general but that's yes. probably as close as it gets to being political i would say 
Oh, I would agree. Like, I totally did not pick up on that, but it makes a lot of sense, uh, especially when there is a scene where there's an expert, a professor of microcomputing, and he's talking about how, you know, the Americans have are probably going to figure out very shortly how to make things that are sentient. Mm -hmm. And watching it in 2024, you're like, not yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We, we have very stupid AI that makes uh, images of big breasted women with eight fingers. <laughs> it's not it's not trying to take over an entire apartment building. And <laughs> no, we are not there quite yet. <laughs> uh, when I when I did, we did a, a series of episodes on shot on video horror movies. And there is mm -hmm. one called The Tower that has a very similar plot. And that one, because it's so low budget, the computer in the tower just absorbs people. So they just because <laughs> they can't really do much else with their budget. <laughs> just sort of absorbs your soul, I guess. <laughs> That's wow. <laughs> um, I should also say that Moss technically remade this in two thousand one. It was really? called it was called either Down or the Shaft. The version that's on Blu Ray now is called Down, but I think the VHS was called the Shaft. Huh. Um. And I had to review that one because they came together. And I was excited for the lift because I had already seen it before. Mm -hmm. and so I had to review those. Of them. And they definitely, it's just a straight horror movie and it doesn't work and it's very dull. But it is oh. one of Naomi Watts's first uh, international films. Oh, really? But, but yeah, it had Naomi Watts in it uh, before she was particularly famous. But I don't recommend it unless you're a big Naomi Watts fan. It's just it's not a bad movie, but it just doesn't work as a serious horror film. You should have just gone back with it being kind of slightly absurd. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Especially because 2001 was like a time when like horror movies were trying to look particularly gritty. Mm. Like, like I guess this would have been it was released before 9-11. It was really after 9-11 that you get stuff like Saw that's really gritty. But um, it still is supposed to look it's not it, it's just not it, it doesn't have the music video vibe it's just not funny it just wasn't i barely remember it and i saw it maybe only four years five well i guess four years ago, probably got six years ago but i barely remember anything about it right where's the lift i have images in my mind <laughs> that i'll always remember oh uh, yeah it's it's just very funny to be watching lift at a time when everybody is like what's gonna happen with ai and you're like ah oh, well we were once afraid of that too and microprocessors yeah. back in the day remember that they didn't really know they didn't know what computers and chips did <laughs> uh and and they didn't care frankly <laughs> no everybody was just guessing and yeah. making it the most flashy that they could in their guesses yeah i mean this would make a good double feature with um death spa which we covered in the killer robot movie, which is actually a movie about a haunted um, computer system at a spa. Well, they use spa, but it's really what we would call like a workout facility these days. Ah. And all of this stuff is computer program for no apparent reason. So, <laughs> so it's stuff like the, um, the, the machine, the lift machine like rips a guy in half because it gives him too much. He can't take the weight. <laughs> but why would why would such a thing exist in the first place? You know, why would you computer? Why would you make that computer operated? But um, yeah, that's a that is those the, this the the lift and death spa both very flashy music video looking very silly funny um, horror movies about uh, sentient and haunted computer programs that don't need to be pr uh, movies about sentient haunted. <laughs> Yeah, it does sound like they'd be a double feature. Yeah, it's like this could just be a haunted uh, spa or a haunted uh, elevator. It doesn't have to also be a computer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, computers are going to run, run us all soon. So Yeah, right. right. <laughs> I say that with a boulder of salt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I guess what we can, are you ready to move on to the last one? I here? sure am, yep. So this one, Brotherhood of the Wolf, uh, I'm going to mess this up, Le Pac de Lou. Um, French film from 2001 directed by Christophe Gans. I'm probably going to say Gaines over and over again. That's just my accent and it should be Gans, I believe. Um, this is me being cheeky. I only picked this one because I wanted an excuse to rewatch it mm -hmm. and because I already covered Dante's Peak, which would have been the fourth one I would have picked otherwise. Gotcha. Um, but 
This one is really just the first half takes stuff from Jaws. And I'm willing to admit mm-hmm. that I, I've kind of pushed the Jaws Without a Shark thing a little bit beyond here. But I'll read the uh, description. <laughs> uh, 18th century France, the Chevalier de Fronzac and his Native American friend Mani are sent to the king of, oh God, another French word, Givaudan. Uh, Christine isn't here to tell me how to pronounce this shit. Uh, to investigate the killings of hundreds by a mysterious beast. So the basic plot does sound very um, Jaws-esque. Do you want to hear uh, my story about when I saw this movie in theaters? Yes, please. So yeah. um, this this movie had some, some buzz going for it at the mm-hmm. time. And it wasn't showing at many theaters. And I hadn't moved to Minnesota. I was going to move to Minnesota. Um, but I went uh, to see this in theater with a couple of friends. And we went to an 11 p.m. showing. Mm-hmm. And I should note that this movie is two and a half hours long. It's long. It's, yeah. It's um, the longest on this list. Two hours and 25 minutes. Yeah, yeah. So it it, it was going to go late. I was going to be there with trailers. I was going to be there past 1 a.m. Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't want to miss it. And then uh, a couple had brought their toddler and baby what? to an 11 p.m. showing of an R-rated monster movie that is entirely in French and subtitled. Oh. Uh... <laughs> And the baby <laughs> cried the whole time. And the oh, little yeah. girl, the little girl, the toddler kept saying shit like, I'm scared and want to go home. I don't understand what they're saying. Can we go home? I'm tired. Can we go home? <laughs> oh, no. Ruined the entire movie for me. I didn't see it again for years because it was just the horrible memory of this time I had to sit in the theater for two and a half hours while these bad parents tortured their children with brotherhood of the wolf oh man <laughs> oh my so. gosh so yeah. I watched it again later and, and it, i don't think it completely works but it is very high concept it is absolutely high concept it is a monster murder mystery kung fu fight um movie with a sort of western twist that's set in 18th century france that is being told in flashback Right. during the waning days of the french revolution and it's beautiful wherever they shot this yes the settings are gorgeous the it's very like it's the most artistic i think monster movie i think i've ever seen yeah it's definitely up there i would i would say that um there's something to be said for uh shin godzilla the um two godzilla movies ago but it's a completely different kind of art- artistry to it Mm. So yeah, that one. It's it's a gorgeously shot movie. Roger Ebert in his review, oh. not a big Roger Ebert fan, but uh he called it an explosion at the genre factory, <laughs> which is a very yes! good way. Yes. And that and I so accurate. I think this is is if you want to tell I always say if you want to know uh the ultimate nineties, late nineties movie, you watch House the House on Haunted Hill remake. It is every mm-hmm. visual cliche. If you want to know uh, the most 2001 movie, the most <laughs> the most pre 9 11 2001 movie, uh, it's this. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's 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 heavily textured, like you said. It's beautiful, and they really focus on the textures of things. Right. The introduction of the two main characters is rainy, rainy, muddy field, and it's all in slow motion, and it's just like absorbing every ounce of texture in the scene. And it's clearly inspired by the Matrix. Absolutely, and the I, the fight scenes are so sophisticated and yeah. so just a pleasure to watch. Normally, in a monster movie, you're like, okay, a fight scene. <laughs> this yeah. is going to be messy and clumsy, and these were just elegant fight scenes. And I think the choreographer of the Matrix did these fight scenes. If it was- I'm it was one of them. It one was them. not Yuan Wu Ping, but it was one of they. They went to. I'm trying to. Uh, I wrote it down here somewhere. They did go to one of the 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 Hong Kong guys to do it, and this was also there was something. Um, I think this this is released so close to um, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon that I don't mm. think there was a direct influence there, but there was that kind of brief period after the Matrix came out where um they re-release stuff like iron monkey in theaters mm-hmm. and so like there was this big like 
we want this balletic wire foo stuff and then it went out of fashion real quick right um people thought it was like too too balletic and they wanted more raw stuff but there was this period in hong kong in the 90s and in american hollywood in the late 90s early 2000s where wire foo is the shit and this mm -hmm. movie has good wire foo it's not yes and i say that as someone who watches a lot of martial arts movies and for what it is i think it is it is it is very well done and um part of that is because they hired mark dacascus to star as Monty, and mm. uh, mark mm -hmm. dacascus is a real martial artist oh um, he is he is um we, we can go into the Indian part uh, <laughs> later, but he is a genuine martial artist and he does do his own choreography in some things. He's in a fantastic movie that most that, that's underrated called Drive um, mm -hmm. with um, Kadeem Hardison and a very young uh, Brittany Murphy. Very uh, young Brittany right. Murphy. Great movie. Really fun. That mostly went straight to video here. Uh, but he's and he was in a movie called that I watched as a kid called Only the Strong. That's sort of like a teacher teaches um, his inner city students capoeira to to okay. help that gang violence <laughs> and and he was in the double dragon movie in the 90s which uh, is is a pretty awful movie but he's you know he's always it's interesting because he's a really charming actor and this is a mostly silent role so right. it it's it's one of the, it's the first thing i ever saw him in where he was a tough guy instead of a funny guy who could do tough stuff mm. which i i always found interesting but I guess, I, yeah, we should say that the idea, uh, the, the French did not have a great relationship with the Native Americans. No. <laughs> historically speaking, um, it was pretty bad. And so I think uh, historically, this is weird. This is almost like a slave thing. I don't think that uh, Gans was really thinking on this level. I think he was borrowing the idea from American Westerns, like the Lone mm -hmm. Ranger has Tonto. This was like right. Lone Ranger and Tonto was his idea. And I don't think they were considering the historic. Um, <laughs> they do pay some lip service to it. There are scenes where um, he has to tell people to stop being dickheads to his, his friend. Yes. Uh, or it's stop like, stop being, being a, stop being a racist. You're yeah. awful. <laughs> yeah. So they pay, pay lip service to it. But, um, you know, it, 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 it's, we live in an era now where we don't really want people who aren't of a race playing that race. Mm -hmm. Um. And I should say, Dacascus isn't Iroquois or Native American. He's multicultural. Uh, he's like he's like everything. Um, mm -hmm. He grew up in Hawaii, but he's not Native Hawaiian either. So, you know, it's it's a little iffy. Um, <laughs> but the uh, to me, the annoying part is, isn't this? I'll spoil a couple things. Is that he is killed to further motivate the white guy, and that that feels yeah. a little. Uh, I think that's the one moment of where I can't like excuse like, well, they weren't thinking of this and this was diff a different time and that kind of thing. They're still killing off the brown guy to motivate the white guy. It's a little annoying. No, um, uh, agreed. It's, it definitely starts really dragging after, yeah. after Manny is killed. So I agree with that. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. The other, the other thing to cost is he was in John Wick three. He was great in John. Oh. Did you ever see John Wick three? No, not yet. He he plays kind of a um, fanboy of John Wick who's sent to kill him. So the whole time they're fighting, he's very excited about it. <laughs> um, nice. He's great. And then he was also, I forgot, he was the chairman for the U.S. version of Iron Chef. Um, oh. So he, he was the guy who introduced everything on the U.S. version of Iron Chef. Oh, so, wow. You know, he's, he's, yeah. And he was on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. as another tough guy who doesn't really talk. Um, mm -hmm. of was an, it was a kind of boring show with surprisingly good action scenes but let's move on from that and we'll discuss why i think this is jaws without a shark yes please do i'm i'm interested i do i can speak a little bit up like i did kind of a tiny deep dive into the actual historical okay yeah yeah part of the we'll, monster we'll, but i want i want to hear what you have to say we'll go into the dumb shit first <laughs> <laughs> um so it opens with a flashback bookend but after that you know we, the, the guy telling the story in a flashback but after that, the first real scene is a pretty blonde being attacked by a, a monster that is entirely yeah. off camera and instead of her being above the water she's on a cliff's edge being tossed about yes. it's clearly just jaw, the beginning of jaws oh yeah 
Um, Absolutely. <laughs> and there is a later scene where the monster attacks another blonde woman in a very large puddle. <laughs> so, yes, that's true. And the the knight Gregory, uh, he's basically a cop from out of town. He's like part of the you know he's, yeah. he's he's sent in to fix this thing, and he's also a naturalist is why they've asked him to do this. So he's sort of an animal cop. So he's sort of a Brody Hooper kind of combo, right? Sort. Of. And then I would argue the Quint character, Jean Francois, who's played by Vincent Cassell in a pretty early blockbuster for him. He mm -hmm. he ended up being in a lot of things. And Monica Bellucci's in this actually. And I'm yes. almost positive that the reason Monica Bellucci is in The Matrix Reloaded is because the Wachowski saw this movie. It just seems like they like they they really? almost fit that lady. That's my my brain. I think that's what happened. Because she plays a very similar character in that. Mm -hmm. Um and Blanca Bellucci is 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 one of the most beautiful women ever, and she's very voluptuous and stuff. But she can also act; she can play more than one character. So yes, absolutely I always thought, agree. I always thought, always thought that they're like, "Hey, could you just basically play the?" Um, she's like a madam. She's like a lot of they, the a lot of the movie takes place in a a, a brothel. Basically, is where their sort of home base is, and mm -hmm. she's the mad. I believe she's the madam of the brothel. I might be wrong there. I think she's just a very highly paid courtesan. Okay. I don't I, think she's the madam, but she's very important. And and the um which you'll probably get into with your historical stuff, the <laughs> very, very, very convoluted plot she is actually more involved in than we think we find out later. But um anyway, the Vincent Cassell character, I bet they met on the set of this movie, actually. They're they they were a couple for quite a while. Um oh, wow. he is sort of sort of recognizable as a quint type for his mm. bluster. And his sort of interest in nature and the natural world. And they're both crazy people. But Jean-Francois is the antagonist. I guess you yes. could you could say Quint, uh, Quint is an antagonist, but he's not a villain. This guy's the villain. He's the main bad. He's absolutely a villain. <laughs> um, and it doesn't remain secret very long. That's really not a spoiler because you, you get it pretty quick. Like he's not doing much to cover that he's the baddie. And there's a, a uncomfortable scene that implies he's also an insexual rapist uh so yeah he's 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 a baddie on a lot of levels mm -hmm. um that's one that that scene is is uncomfortable and so i would i would say that like i guess that's a bit of a content warning is that there's a implied rape scene that's pretty gross um yeah thankfully it is comp very short yes yes um but then i would say that the dacascus's character is also has a little bit of Hooper in him, but he's mm -hmm. missed but and, and him, but they've already been friends. It's missing the bromance component because these two are already right. they're already a work couple, basically. It's true. Yeah. Um I mean this is one case where if you want to read homoeroticism into it, it's pretty easy. Like, <laughs> that is, yeah. That's there accurate. definitely would be bisexual because we see them with the courtesans in, in the brothel. But yeah, mm -hmm. they, you don't have to stretch <laughs> You don't have to stretch the story too much to to write your uh, fan fiction about these two. Nope, um, not at all. <laughs> and then uh, the third act of basically four acts. This feels like a four act mm -hmm. structure movie. Um, three men, uh, Monty, Gregory, and there's this little marquee that goes along with him who we know is the narrator. So we know he's not going to die. Right. They set out into nature to capture the beast, but it doesn't end the story like it does in Jaws. There's there's a no. whole other act to go after that. Um, but the thing that always really gets me is that they purposefully, they capture the wrong beast. They capture a sort of large wolf. Mm -hmm. And the people in charge, the government people, tell them, we're going to tell everybody that this is the killer. So it's very much yes. the Titan shark in uh, Jaws. That's the scene that I remember being in the theater and going, oh, this is like Jaws. So Yeah, no, it very much, it very much is. And so that's really that's really where my my Jaws Without the Shark ends is is kind of there. But there's there's enough stuff, but you know then there's there's a, a lot of bodice ripper stuff going on. There's <laughs> yes. kung fu going. So you know the conspiracy part is is way beyond anything you'd see in Jaws. There's no conspiracy in Jaws. The conspiracy no. in Jaws is that they want to keep the beaches open. This is like it's so convoluted that I honestly recommend not trying to figure it out while you're watching it <laughs> just let the movie tell you things like it's not like it's not a movie that invites you to try to figure it out no just it's, it's, some parts are like just let it be pretty yeah 
it's a movie that tells you information when it wants to tell you information there's there's no getting ahead of the plot in this movie because it's just too much it's just too much stuff going on there's like the huge information dump scenes Um, yes (laughs) it's it's why it's such a long movie because i mean in part because kung fu scenes are like dance scenes like and musicals tend to be long because the dance scene takes up time but a lot of it's just people talking incessantly about Mm -hmm. stuff (laughs) um right. there is we watched and also we watched the theatrical version there's a director's cut that i did not get my hands on when i sent you a copy i've oh, never seen the director's cut it's even longer so god knows how oh, much my. more stuff happens i'm sure i know this movie has its fans and i don't mean to insult it so you know oh, so uh, i would love, people. i would love to know what the difference is with the longer cut because i've never seen i've seen this version maybe three times but i've never seen the longer cut mm, yeah i can't i can't imagine <laughs> Like, you know, it's already very long and convoluted, but I, you're right. I watched, we watched this while ago and I was replaying Assassin's Creed, one of them. I don't remember which one. And it's kind of like an Assassin's Creed game mm. where, where it's a historical, it's a historical mystery. Mm-hmm. And there's just no way to guess what's going to happen. It just, you just kind of got to let the characters in the game tell you in the cutscenes oh, what, what the plot is and then go back right. to, to doing fights is basically you just go with it right it's so it's so true like i did like i said a tiny history dive Uh and i will say when this is like people's favorite movie like people love this movie people think this is one of the best movies ever made and i'm like okay (laughs) (laughs) you i don't know that i agree with them but for a monster movie it is very well done very beautiful and i will say it i think only the french really could have done this movie and the reason i say that is because this was actually the 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 script that they used for brotherhood of the wolf is actually very clever because it does wend in pieces of history Mm -hmm. real history that happened into into the screenplay so basically there was actually a very a monster that was going around killing people (laughs) in this Mm -hmm. place and they couldn't catch it. They did do a massive hunt, still couldn't catch it. Uh, Of course there was no Fransac. There was no, you know, love story, none of that, but you know, they eventually, there was pressure from Versailles to find this thing and kill it so that people could just get on with their lives and not, and not have to worry anymore. Because what was happening is that the, you know, crops and all this stuff, people weren't, people weren't traveling, people weren't doing commerce. And so, yeah. and the, they're starting to put pressure on the king. Like the nobles are like, where is, you know, I'm not making as much money because my crops aren't my people won't go out in the fields to get my crops because they're afraid of this monster you know people are dying on the way to the marketplace do something so there was a lot of pressure so there was actually a wolf that was caught um Mm -hmm. they did um as fransac does in the movie they did embalm it and send it to versailles and put it on display Mm -hmm. and (laughs) actually it was already decomposing by the time they embalmed it so it was quite a sight and smell Mm -hmm. in versailles i will say um from the the stories i heard but um at the same time there was like this little conspiracy because within i think six months there was another spate of wolf attacks Mm. and so Again, there was another huge wolf, not as big as the first one, but another huge wolf that was killed. And so people started saying, oh, you know, maybe it was a conspiracy. Maybe somebody turned this creature on people and then we only had peace because they were training up the next one. So mm-hmm. it, it it's very interesting how it takes those little bits of history and kind of wends it into the plot and i would say as i said i think only the french could do this because if it was american it would have been way more bloody <laughs> yeah because the actual creature did like it was ripping heads off and stuff like it was bad we get the artistic nice version <laughs> in this movie it's it's actually the thing i would compare it to uh, uh um on a thematic level 
is the movie version of uh from hell mm. in that it takes because that, because that's that has some in common with the comic but it's kind of its own thing mm-hmm. um and that that takes a historical thing the jack the ripper killings and creates a much more convoluted uh uh po- political conspiracy as to the reason why the thing is happening right and i think those movies came out the same year actually which is kind of fun. they don't have a lot else in common but that that, that the idea of historical fiction that is really going in on the conspiracy side is, is yeah kind of cool. and i do have to give a shout out that the creature which you don't see till the end mm-hmm. um was actually a mix of CGI and puppetry from yeah. Jim Henson's workshop. So I'm like, anything that's to do with with puppetry and stuff, I'm like, that's very impressive. The puppet uh, is great. The puppet yes. is fucking fantastic. Um, the CG isn't as good. And I remember yeah. it not being great even at the time. <laughs> Especially uh, Cassell, Vincent Cassell's like weird sword, segmented sword thing at the end. Right. That was interesting. <laughs> There's like a whole thing where he's like pretending he only has one arm. It's very, Correct. it's just stuff. There's just so much stuff. And I honestly think part of it is, I, I think Christoph Gans didn't think he was going to get to make another movie. And so <laughs> there's like, that happens sometimes uh, where they just like, every idea they've ever had gets thrown into a movie because this might be their only shot. Okay, um, that makes a lot more sense, actually, that's, if that's... that's just a, I mean, it's a guess, but I mean, this there's like... This is like a Scooby-Doo movie in some ways. Like, I, I have to admit, I'm a little disappointed that the monster's not a monster. I, I was always hoping that right. the monster has a supernatural origin. And like like the From Beyond adaptation, there is, it's, it, there is a, uh, not logical explanation, but a natural explanation for everything. Right. And it's... It's really interesting because it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it try it. So it's like a historical drama based on actual things that happened. Right. But then they shove, you know, amazing choreography and they shove like period costumes and they shove a romance subplot and they shove like a conspiracy with the Pope plot in there. Yeah. And then yeah, they yeah. shove like, all these other things in there and then go here you go here's your movie <laughs> and yeah. that can be a little like what is happening here somebody they needed an editor to mm. they needed mm. a producer who was telling them maybe maybe dial it back and save some of that <laughs> for something else i finally found uh, we were talking about uh, it, the matrix uh, the uh, the choreographer the one cho- uh, choreographer's name i recognize is jackie yun who mm-hmm. did Hard Boiled, which is my favorite John Woo movie, and he did Ronnie Yu's The Bride with White Hair, which is a wonderful uh, uh, fantasy horror wire foo kind of thing. So it wasn't Yun Wu Ping, but it was like a guy who is known for doing good things. So yeah, I knew I I knew I I had written something <laughs> bad about it. I was gonna say it is a beautiful movie. Like yes, it is a monster movie that is gorgeous. I. You know, if you're like, I want to want to want to watch a monster movie, but I don't, you know, I want kind of like nice clothes and nice scenery in there. Costume drama. This is, this is your movie. This is a movie where um, Monica Bellucci's naked body morphs into a mountainscape. Yes. And, and I mean, I am not hurt by seeing a half naked monica bellucci and 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 it's the type of movie that lets you know it's okay to giggle at that image it's like what come on guys that's silly but like you know that the movie itself is like winking and nodding with you like ah you see it now and it's so Mm -hmm. funny because the french name things after boobs all the time did the grand teton (laughs) mountains like we just oh it's the grand teton no that's like teton isn't even it's like slang it's It's just, yeah, it's a, that's the most French thing to me is that those mountains look like breasts, don't they? Yeah, I think they do. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, it, it, there, I was kind of like, oh, nudity. All right. Also, this is French. Makes sense. It, it feels like, it feels like um, cable softcore nudity. Like it's not. <laughs> yes. It's, it's gratuitous, but like classy kind of stuff. Right. Is, Ex- right it. Gratuitous, but not exploitative. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's it. That's a perfect way to put it. 
Um, yeah, no, I agree. I, I thought I was like, am I watching like HBO? What yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what yeah. is happening here? Because suddenly it becomes a Skinamax <laughs> movie for like a second and a couple scenes. Right, right. I mean, in a way, we're making it sound better than it is. <laughs> It's, but it, but you can't help it. Like when, when you can't describe this movie without it sounding fantastic, which I think the reason why I don't like it that much is because it sounds like the best movie you've ever seen <laughs> and it can't quite live up to that. I um, mean, it's a, it attempts really well, yeah. but you're right. It's like, it's got a lot of hype around it that, I mean, people that I saw in reviews were like, this is the best movie ever. This is my favorite movie. And and more power to them. I like, th- that's right. great. That's great. I'm happy that this made someone that happy, honestly. Right. I'm, I'm happy it exists. <laughs> I'm happy to. I don't feel like I wasted my life. I've watched some movies before that I'm like, can I can I please get that yeah. time back? And this, this is not uh, one of them. <laughs> Avalanche Sharks, perhaps. <laughs> Actually, I enjoyed that one. That okay. one was, the one that I was like, please give me my life back was Four-Headed Shark Attack. Oh, it's I've bad. heard. It's bad. It sucks your soul. Don't do it. I've heard. Um, yeah. Gons is an interesting filmmaker, but he did not have, I, I wonder if if the, the fact that this movie has so much going on says something about the way he works mm. and that a lot of his movies don't get made. And my friend Justin and I covered his version of Silent Hill on our video game movie podcast. Oh, interesting. Which is another gorgeous movie that I don't particularly like. Justin loves it, so I'm not going to say bad things about it. But <laughs> um, it just has a lot of stuff going on. And then he did one of three movies in this horror anthology I like called Necronomicon. From, um, but uh, his is the boringest one. It's just oh. it's just three shorts based very loosely on um, H.P. Lovecraft stories, and his is almost too strictly based on the story itself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the only other movie he's finished is a 2014 adaptation of Beauty and the Beast that is not to be confused with the Disney live action. I was gonna say, I'm like, please, I, this doesn't sound I, like somebody who's gonna do child friendly fare. Uh, yeah, no, Cassell <laughs> played the Beast in that one. I haven't seen it, but it was more aimed at adult audiences. I think it was mm-hmm. supposed to sort of be a remake of the the really old. I don't, I don't think it's silent, but the very old French. I think it was from the you know. '60s. If yeah. I'm thinking the it, same one you are, it's a remake of that instead of like the Disney movie or the book strictly. Mm-hmm or I guess it's not a book, more of a a novella. But yeah, so he has had an interesting career and he keeps trying to get stuff off the ground and it just seems like his his career is full of that. So I do wonder if he just tries, he overdoes it and producers Mm -hmm. just walk away. (laughs) I I haven't found very many interviews with him, but I would be very curious. He seems like a cool guy. He's Mm -hmm. he's supposedly doing a Silent Hill sequel soon. Supposedly. interesting. As of this recording, uh, July 21st, 2024 he is still (laughs) supposedly doing a silent hill sequel we'll see if that ever happens though yeah i'd be interested to see how much he tries to stuff in that one yeah exactly but that's all i got on this same here i just it was an interesting movie to to research um and it's interesting how beloved it is by yeah. many people when you look when you look on the the web just how many people are really have fond memories of this movie or really consider it like one of the best things they've ever seen yeah and i was looking at my list here a, a couple i w- if we would have covered more the car is kind of an interesting idea that it's jaws with a car <laughs> Um, not to be confused with the Stephen King one. What was that one? Uh, Christine? Well, it's like, Christine, but he's written more than that. There's also one about a Buick that kills people. I can't <laughs> <laughs> he has multiple, multiple stories uh, about killer cars. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Trimmers. I think Trimmers is a really good use of Jaws trope mm. that's uh, different, you know? A lot of people really like Lake Placid. I'm not a huge oh, fan. Oh, is that of the one with the? It's a crocodile. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, or it's either an alligator or a crocodile. It's a giant crocodilia. Mm-hmm. Uh, either way, and uh, I love the host, which is a Korean movie. About oh, right. Um, that's a great movie. And then, actually, um, interestingly enough, I just finally saw Godzilla minus one, and there is a part in the middle that is just Jaws that they go out on the ocean to 
uh, they have a plan to that they think that they put a, a mine inside of Godzilla's mouth that will actually hurt him. The Godzilla hmm. in, in that movie can sort of reform. He has like 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 Wolverine style uh, st- stuff. Mm-hmm. The whole scene is set up very much like uh, like the uh, the ending of Jaws. It's actually in the middle of the movie. It's not the climax or anything, but they definitely go out of their way to evoke Jaws in that one. That's interesting. Yeah, that is on my list of of yeah, it was movies good. to see. As a as a as a nerdy and snobby Godzilla fan, I resent <laughs> a little it, that it's being called the best Godzilla movie ever, uh-huh. but it's very good. It's like maybe top top 10 top 5 Godzilla movies also. But can it really be a good Godzilla movie if Mothra's not involved? Come on. <sighs> it's true. I do. I mean <laughs> I love Mothra. I'm a huge Mothra fan, honestly. Uh the original Godzilla versus Mothra is one of the best Godzilla movies. Mm, um, mm-hmm. And I, I love the uh, American uh, King of the Monsters in large part right. because they involve the other monsters. I do remember seeing that one and being like, yes, this, this I enjoy this. I like, <laughs> do you have any sort of, do you want to share any sort of a social media thing or are you sort of hidden from the world? Um, I'm not a Luddite, but I'm also, I don't. No, uh, yeah, I didn't really mean Luddite. Have... <laughs> no, I know. I, I don't really have anything that's public at okay. the moment. So, um, so no, I don't have, really have any social media to share, but I am so excited that we were able to, to do this yeah. and so excited with the movies that we watched. And I, you know, I'm going to say, like, I think I've got a new, just like favorite absurd movie in the lift. I'd... Yeah, cool. Awesome. Awesome. The Blu-ray is really nice, too. It has some extras on it. If you, uh, I don't know if you buy things like I do, collect things, <laughs> but yeah, it's pretty good Blu-ray. Okay, well, then in that case, I'll just say that uh, you can find me on the Genre Grinder website. I'm technically, there is still a Genre Grinder Twitter at Chandra Grinder and at Gabe uh, M as in Matthew Powers on Twitter. Those are only used for links at this point. Uh, I can be found at Gabe Powers on Blue Sky. There is a Chandra Grinder Facebook page. And uh, we have a Patreon now, or I have a Patreon, that is, uh, I thank everybody who has uh, given money to that because, uh, again, it is covering the cost of the web page at this point. So I am no longer doing that out of pocket. And that is, I'm very thankful for that. So, um, That's so awesome. otherwise, until next time, beware of the ocean and the lakes and the swamps and the pools, pretty much any body of water and the forest and the elevator, probably your backyard. <laughs> Everything. Maybe you stay in bed and don't look on the earth. Bye-bye.